want it. Uh, so thanks for coming to our last uh, protein uh, design and uh, modeling meetup. Uh, last one of the year. It's been a heck of a heck of a year. Uh, we've had a lot of great talks um, going back and forth between Cambridge and uh, Boston. So thanks for sticking around and not flying home to be with your family so you can be here. Uh, before I introduce Sujan, I want to give the mic to Sebastian and thank Novo Nordis for sponsoring uh, the event tonight and uh, purchasing this delicious Indian food that you're eating. So, Sebastian. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, it feels a little weird to be here or living on a massive company that I looked up for not very long, but I'm um, standing in for my manager. Um, we are totally open on the team, so I don't know if I'm like that team. We're um, in the computational drug design group, and um, we're interested in applying deep learning models to model design peptides, um, natural and modified. Uh, we're also kind of like expanding the portfolio and looking at other kinds of modalities. Um, our team divides their time between supporting research projects and also developing new tech. Um, there's a lot of positions that are currently open at the company. Um, some in our group and some in other groups. If you guys are interested, um, feel free to talk to me. I don't know about every position, but I'd be happy to get in touch with somebody who might be more relevant. Um, and yeah, it's a cool place to work. Uh, that's all. And looking forward to see John's talk. It'll be awesome. Thanks, Sebastian. Seeing if we have uh, mic difficulties. Okay, this is still on. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know what, I might stand here so that people on Zoom might see me. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Sue Jung. Um, and so she uh, comes all the way from MIT uh, and was able to find the building <laughs> uh, despite the odds. And so she's been doing really, really cool stuff with uh, computational modeling, machine learning, uh, with proteins, um, uh, uh, protein ligand complexes and, and small molecule docking. Um, and then more recently at MIT, uh, uh, studying um, uh, dynamics of proteins and being able to model coarse grained uh, and back map, as she'll talk about today, to uh, full atom models. So I think this is a really interesting um, area for modeling pro proteins so that maybe we can get into uh, longer time scales, uh, which will be really exciting to do that really, really rapidly. Okay, so the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much for speaking tonight. I'm uh, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, how do I turn this on? Is so it already? It should be on. Maybe just tap it. So I don't know. I think the battery might be pretty bad. Let's see if this. Uh, well, I can just talk louder. <laughs> yeah, you might just need to talk. Yeah. No worries, no worries. Okay, you have to be, you have to project. Okay, I'll yeah. try. I was in a, a theater club in my high school, so I, <laughs> hopefully I still have the muscle memory in my <laughs> vocal cord. Um, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Chris and everyone uh, for inviting me and having me as a speaker. So today I will um, talk about protein simulations and then uh, course grain simulations and then how to go back to uh, higher resolution. <laughs> and uh, before I forget, I want to advertise something because I think it's a very relevant audience. So uh, yeah, me and uh, other organizing team, uh, our proposal for the ICLI workshop got accepted recently and it'll be about integrating generative modeling and experimental platforms uh, for biomolecular design. So these are the agendas and uh, potential themes for the workshop. And uh, exciting thing is uh, we partner with, with cell systems. Uh, so they will do a special collection um, with the uh, selected uh, submissions of the workshop. So yeah, please look forward to it and then uh, please you know, if you have relevant projects, then, uh, yeah. Okay, so back to uh, protein simulations. So um, 
a lot of uh, efforts have been done on protein structure prediction. Like AlphaFold, it's amazing. Um, it predicts a protein structure in like pretty good accuracy, but uh, conformational landscape exploration is still, uh, there's a still a long way to go. And it's important because conformational changes in flexible proteins have a lot of biological implications, like uh, it affects binding, recognition, aggregation. Um, so for example, there's a, a, in a protein-protein binding system, um, there sometimes there's you know, only one of the many potential metastable states bind to the target protein. So uh, not only um, discovering one possible confirmation is important, we want to discover like many potential co uh, confirmations, especially for flexible proteins. Oh, and before I move on, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. And um, coarse grains MD simulations are my interest because, um, yeah, uh, MD simulations, we use uh, MD simulations a lot to like sample different protein conformations. But if we sample in all autumn level, the step size is usually a few, non few femtoseconds. However, the biologically relevant conformational changes, um, they occur in like much, much longer time scale, like, you know, uh, several microseconds or even milliseconds. So that means we need like uh, tons of iterations to get to the point where we, we want to go. And not only that, uh, the potential energy landscape is uh, rough because proteins are a very high dimensional system. Um, and then when we meet the energy barrier, then, uh, you know, uh, because and these simulations are, you know, based on uh, Newton's law of motion, uh, it sometimes it uh, you know it takes a long long time to get over the energy barrier and we call that metastability. Um, but coarse graining might uh, make this uh, transition faster because it allows larger time step size and also it reduces a lot of degrees of freedom and also uh, because the degrees of freedom are lost, uh, the potential energy landscape can be smoother, at least locally. So it enables us to have a uh, faster transition and convergence. Um, so there, there is a very recent um, paper on transferable coarse grain potential, MD potential. And then according to the paper, uh, their coarse grain potential uh, simulation was up to 500 times faster than all of those simulations in terms of slowest relaxation time scale of protein folding. So coarse graining uh, is very useful. There are several different types of uh, coarse graining mapping schemes and force fields. And one of the most popular one is called Martini. And as general purpose for force field, we can use it for material discovery. We can use it for like protein simulations, lipid simulation, RNA simulations. And it's uh, mapping two to four atoms to one bead. And it's not only coarse graining mapping scheme, it's also force field. So um, people use Martini a lot, but the consensus is, I think, um, it's good for uh, modeling interactions, especially uh, interactions uh, involving membranes, but uh, intra-protein, intra-molecular interactions, uh, Martini sometimes have hard time modeling it. So um, there are a lot of works trying to develop uh, protein-specific coarse grain force fields. Um, and then a lot of them uh, map one amino acid into one bead. So specifically, uh, we, you know, uh, place the bead on the C alpha atom on uh, amino acid. And this is the recent uh, transferable coarse grain potential that I mentioned. It's from uh, Cecilia Clementi, Frank Noe group. Um, 
And then what they did was, so here, uh, this is like example showing the uh, potential of uh, coarse grain simulations. So here in this figure, this is uh, like a landscape of protein conformations. Um, and here, uh, this little pink dot is uh, alpha fold generative structure. While uh, these gray dots are NMR observed structures. But uh, using the coarse grained MD simulation, they could find um, another metastable state, which was not discovered from either alpha fold or uh, NMR. But um, yes. But now, uh, today, my talk is mainly about bat mapping and not the coarse grain potential. So bat mapping is to, uh, it's uh, opposite uh, operation of coarse graining. So coarse graining is, you know, it's uh, just uh, grouping uh, all the atoms within one amino acid as one bead, but bat mapping is to reconstruct all the atomic placements. And it can be very, very useful because First, uh, recovery of atomistic detail uh, gives us a lot of information. So um, if we have good coarse grain potential and if we have good bat mapper, then we can uh, quickly explore conformational states with coarse grain simulations and uh, while still recovering all the atomistic details uh, needed for, for example, if we want to find a new um, metastable state, and then if we want to perform docking with it, um, then we might we need all atom resolution. And also, we can uh, do more detailed mechanistic study, like uh, you know, this uh, sometimes not only the placement of the residue matters, but also like the orientation of the side chains matter uh, in uh, many biological processes. Um, and another advantage is that uh, sometimes coarse grain potentials are not accurate. Um, not only sometimes, but uh, I think the current state of, even the current state of the art cannot really reconstruct the uh, ensemble properties that well. Um, and, uh, but we know that all atom potential, all atom MD potential is more accurate and it has like higher fidelity. So if we can go back to all atom resolution, that means that we can recalculate the uh, forces or energies. Um, we can recalculate the labels uh, and get more accurate um, proxy. And um, we can use this in active learning scheme of coarse grain potentials. Um, and the machine learning coarse grain potentials are trained with uh, force matching objective, which is basically here, uh, this F is uh, force and all atom resolution. And this uh, operation is a mapping operation, which means that if the mapping, for example, is uh, just, uh, you know, uh, yeah, considering one amino acid as one bead, then maybe we can average all the forces uh, in one amino acid. And then like, this is the average. And here, this is uh, the force computed in coarse grain resolution from the coarse grain potential. So we want to match the um, average of the all atom labels to uh, current, uh, the prediction for the current coarse grain structure. And um, with bat mapping, with uh, reliable bat mapping, what we can do is we can run coarse grain simulation and then we can bat map it and then we can recalculate the labels, uh, better labels, higher fidelity labels, and then retrain the coarse grain MD model. Yes. How many times does this happen over the course of the simulation? Is it you run, you run a full coarse grain simulation. Mm. Then after the full simulation, you back mapping, or do you, is this um, during the simulation? So this uh, iterative training and active learning is uh, not done yet. This is uh, you know. So right now, uh, we don't have. 
So we have good enough, like it's getting better. The CG potentials are getting better and bad members are getting better. But I think uh, once we are on the, like above certain threshold, we can like make it even better using this uh, active learning scheme. So this is uh, one potential future, very, very near future uh, usage of uh, bat mapping and CGMD. Yes. And so bat mapping, mapping is done. Is it like fully rigid, the backbone? Like, does it require that the atoms be able to get all? Or is there some flexibility in the atoms that there's a clash or something that you can't put in the result? So that's a really good question. Um, so intrinsically proteins and amino acids have flexibility. And then uh, one, like one, so uh, because of that one coarse grain structure can correspond to many all atom structures. So that's why uh, we're trying to do generative bat mapping, which will come later. Um, yes, but backbone should be flexible. Yes. Okay. So these were uh, previous methods of back mapping. Uh, these two methods are still uh, very frequently used. Um, and these are uh, from geometric rules. So here, uh, this method is called CG2AA, uh, CG2 all atom. And then uh, the rules are, uh, for example, here we have like three, uh, consecutive C alphas, and then um, uh, by some statistical analysis, researchers found that uh, the peptide bond here is uh, a lot of times it's perpendicular to this plane of three C alphas. So using this kind of geometric rules uh, with a back mapping, um, model here, uh, it's uh, also rule-based so here we do some initial placements of side chains that satisfy a set of like restraints. And then uh, it runs energy optimization with uh, some force field. But the issue here is um, they are like, these are deterministic methods. So it cannot uh, give us the flexibility we need. Like it doesn't generate the distribution of all atom structures given uh, coarse grain structure. Also, uh, because, especially for modeler, because it uses energy minimization step to correct the initially um, little bit rough uh, structure, um, it's slow. Here, uh, so ZenZProt is my model, my back mapper. I named it ZenZProt because, you know, I'm ZenZ, I guess. <laughs> and uh, uh, the model generates Z matrix which means it generates an internal coordinate. Um, so here, this is the speed analysis. Uh, my uh, neural network-based model performs much, much, much faster than uh, this uh, other method. So yes, as I just mentioned, uh, one coarse grain structure should correspond to many all atom structures because you know backbone has flexibility and side chains also have has flexibility even when the C alpha is fixed. Um, uh, our group, previous member of our group, Ujie, he uh, formulated the problem as generative modeling problem. So the uh, formulation is given the um, coarse grain structure, large X, uh, learn the conditional distribution of the all atom structure, small X. And we use VAE, variational autoencoder, uh, to implement this formulation. So here, uh, the encoder takes all atom structures as input and also a coarse grain structure. And the decoder uh, outputs the all atom structure. And the prior takes the condition, which is uh, coarse grain structure as input. And we, by minimizing the KL divergence between those two uh, latent vectors, um, yeah, in the inference step, uh, the prior uh, will be able to input 
the coarse grain structure and decoder should be able to output a distribution of all atom structures corresponding to the coarse grain structure. Um, so that was Uja's work in 2022. And what I did later is uh, achieving transferability with uh, local inference. So what does that mean is, um, so the original model, it was tested on small systems like Chignolin, which has like 10 amino acids. And then it was system specific, which means that it had to be trained on the system uh, that we want to test on, test it on. And um, here uh, we thought, so why, why not make it transferable? Because um, if we know, like the assumption, the hypothesis we had was that if we know the local coarse screen geometry of like, if we know all the uh, local placements of the residues, then we might be able to infer the local all atom geometry. So here, for example, uh, yeah, maybe uh, we can use human imagination um, here because you know the tryptophan uh, has nitrogen atom in its side chain, and uh, these residues has have uh, oxygen atoms in their uh, backbone. Maybe they they can form hydrogen bonding, and then like uh, this tryptophan side chain should be near the backbone. So this kind of inference, if we can uh, do this kind of inference, the machine learning model might also be able to make this inference. So um, yeah, the uh, what we wanted to show is the model trained on enough local geometry examples uh, will be transferable. And uh, this was the transferability was not achieved before because there was no, uh, good enough data set, but in 2021, this uh, data set called Protein Ensemble Database PED was released. And it was uh, pretty you know, appropriate for our use because uh, PED is the database of protein confirmation of ensembles. It has a total uh, 200, more than 200 protein entries. And the entry, each entry was generated by computational sampling methods like uh, MD simulations or uh, Monte Carlo sampling. But um, yeah, it, it was not. So I will like talk about this more later on, but it's not the most uh, appropriate data set because uh, here uh, all the entries come from, are made from different machine learning, uh, different MD force fields. MD and MC force fields, and then uh, their simulated temperatures are also all different. So it will not give us the most accurate description of like local, uh, yeah, local uh, structure distribution, but we thought this was good enough for the proof of concept study. And also uh, the ensembles generated from MD or MC were, um, a carefully uh, built by uh, ensemble selection method, which constrains uh, the ensemble with experimental measurements from NMR, uh, like NMR chemical shift peak intensities. Um, so the ensemble statistics at least uh, match with the experimental values. So we did a lot of like filtering, uh, filtering out um, proteins with uh, like uh, very rare post-translational modifications um, or like we filtered out proteins with like ligand binding or RNA binding. But uh, at the end, we had 80-ish uh, uh, protein entries in our training set uh, with various degrees of protein compactness and size. So we thought including various degrees of uh, protein flexibility and size is important because uh, only if then the model will be able to see uh, diverse local geometry. So the model, we want the model to behave well uh, on like very compact globular proteins. We also want to 
uh, want the model to behave well on like flexible uh, disordered area. So here, this is the statistics of the data sets. Um, there are a lot of folded proteins, but there are also a lot of like denatured proteins. The size of the proteins uh, also varies a lot. And um, there were uh, some cases where uh, the proteins had more than one chain. So uh, it was like protein complexes uh, because we wanted to uh, make the model transferable and uh, arbitrary as possible. And compared to PDB data set, uh, PDB data set is mostly consisted of X-ray structures, um, but PED, um, yeah, we have like more uh, com confirmation of diversity and also uh, the ensemble statistics were uh, at least like trustworthy. So, um, so from now I'm I'm gonna explain the model architecture and uh, what kind of uh, innovations we made to um, make the transferable model work. So here, um, to encode the local geometry, we used equivariant message passing on residues uh, with the distance cutoff of uh, twenty one Armstrong because you know the longest. Uh, residue, which is arginin, uh, the end-to-end -end distance is like uh, nine Armstrong. So we thought, you know, uh, 21 should be enough. And uh, with this message passing, we obtain residue-wise uh, representation. And then uh, this residue-wise representation uh, goes to, uh, generates the latent variables um, of the VAE. And we uh, we can generate like multiple possible structures by sampling from this uh, reparametrized uh, distribution. And our decoder uh, decodes and in internal coordinates uh, rather than Cartesian coordinates because we wanted to uh, make the chemical validity better by constraining the the bond lengths. And then the question was, uh, given the uh, given only the C alpha placements, how should we how can we place other backbone atoms? Uh, here we got the hint from uh, the CG two AA previous rule based method. So their um, yeah their idea was uh, the plane that three consecutive C alphas make is perpendicular to the uh, peptide bond. And we thought that uh, this is kind of giving us hint that we can place um, a backbone atom using three consecutive C alphas as anchors. Since bond length has very small variance, we just uh, fixed it um, and um, angle and dihedral. So our degrees of freedom was uh, the angle. That's my mouth. The, this angle, um, so let's say if we are placing this carbon atom, then uh, carbon C alpha and its neighbor C alpha, this angle is uh, our degrees of freedom. And also uh, the torsion angle, the dihedral angle that this plane and this carbon atom makes is also uh, part of our degrees of freedom. And um, our analysis showed that um, this angle and dihedral angles are pretty well correlated. So we uh, decided to jointly predict uh, those two degrees of freedom from the same latent variable. And then what we have also observed is um, this. So our uh, VAE samples uh, residue-wise, however, uh, the because uh, our placement uh, uses information of uh, neighbor C alpha neighbor residues as well. We have to make sure that uh, this like generation of this uh, degrees of freedom talk to uh, other residues. 
So we compare, we here we compare um, two decoders. First, a uh, message passing decoder where uh, neighbor residues can talk to each other. And here, LP decoder, which just takes the uh, latent variable as input and then uh, outputs at, uh, the angles uh, residue wise. So here we can see that um, with message passing, we have we get much, much better correlation of the true and uh, sampled uh, angles. It's not autoregressive. So we do it all at once. We um, sample from latent uh, distribution, and then uh, we do message passing, and then we uh, generate all the angles all uh, of like backbone side chain all at once. So it'll be it'll show much better reconstruction if we do it autoregressively, but uh, then we will have to sacrifice the speed. So I think that's the, there's a trade-off and yeah, that's the decision to make. Yep. And then once we placed all the backbone atoms, now we want to place the sidechain atoms. So sidechain atoms, um, it was more, it's more straightforward because it's residualized. Um, here we, Where's my mouse? So, uh, yeah. If we know three, if we have three anchors, then uh, we can place the fourth atom uh, only with internal coordinates, distance, angle, and dihedral angle. So, for example, here, uh, if the C alpha and C beta and C gamma are already placed, then uh, the C delta can be placed if we know the distance here and then angle the angle here and the torsion angle here. So yeah, we generate, uh, since we have, we already have three uh, atoms and one residue uh, from backbone, from C alpha and uh, N and C from the backbone, we can uh, just uh, place all the side chain atoms. And then the learning objectives. So what we have observed is uh, it's important to supervise on both internal coordinates and Cartesian coordinates. So internal coordinates, since you know uh, this is our uh, manifold of generation, um, it's yeah it's important to supervise on the internal coordinates. But also um, if we just supervise on internal coordinates, then we uh, cannot really prevent the steric clashes. Uh, which we want to avoid. Like we don't want to atoms to be uh, too close uh, that like it'll form a bond where uh, it shouldn't. So yeah, supervising on both uh, really helped with the performance. How are you, how are you defining your steric clash? Mm. So the steric clash, uh, we had a very uh, soft, threshold. So here, what this is saying is if uh, two, you know, if the distance between two atoms is lower than two Armstrong, then we give, uh, we give it a penalty. Yes. And this is the comparison between internal coordinate based generation versus Cartesian coordinate based uh, generation. So here, uh, this is our this is our model, and this is uh when we change the decoder to just uh directly predict the Cartesian coordinates, um, and we can see that, uh you know there's a lot of broken bonds here, uh not chemically valid structures here, but uh internal coordinate based generation it's like much more constrained and uh. Yeah, it makes it chemically makes more sense. And this is the example of uh samples from our model. So the uh, red structure is the original structure, and then we coarse grain it to uh, C alphas, 
and then we uh, sampled with uh, sampled ten times with our model, and we can see that uh, there's some uh, like it doesn't only reconstruct the original structure uh, because it's uh, the information is already lost, but it also it samples uh, all the potential uh, all of the structures. So here this argument. This argument uh, doesn't need to be doesn't need to always have this orientation because you know there's nothing uh, besides, so that's why it's like flapping, and the same for other uh, yeah other amino acids as well, and this is uh, comparing the distribution between ground truth and sampled of uh, backbone and side chain dihedral angles. And this is, um, for backbone angles, it shows pretty good reconstruction. Um, but for side chain angles, uh, so chi one is the torsion angle for the C alpha C beta uh, bond. And chi two is torsion angle for the uh, C beta C gamma bond. And uh, it is uh, getting some, it is recovering some modes here, but uh, sometimes it's a little bit off. Sometimes the, uh, the distribution is not that accurate. And this is, um, yeah, this is showing uh, more, Oh, it can be smaller or larger than that because our loss function, it accounts for the periodicity. Um, and uh, the generation, the placement itself is, you know, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. So this is a more detailed view of uh, side chain torsion angles. So yeah, we can see that it's getting some modes correctly, but then the intensity is, the density is a bit different. Uh, I think it's because the data set we used is uh, not really detailed, which means that, you know, if, uh, we like sample, we do MD uh, simulation for like one microsecond. And then if we uh, take like frames from every like 10 picosecond, then the uh, collective frames might represent uh, uh, like the variances in uh, all autumn level pretty well. But the PED data set, um, it has much, much larger uh, gap between one frame to other frame. So uh, it does uh, reconstruct the, it does uh, correctly have the uh, ensemble statistics. So it does represent the global density well, but I don't think it really represents the local density well. And this is some uh, quantitative score analysis compared to um, other deterministic uh, non-machine learning models, the runtime is much faster. Compared to modeler, uh, the steric clash ratio is um, worse, but note that this is a uh, percent. So it's like 0.4% uh, is, yeah, still could be acceptable. Uh, so modeler, it, runs the little, uh, short MD to relax the structure a little bit. So uh, maybe we should like compare uh, the modeler without uh, the relaxation step, but that was, uh, yeah, I couldn't implement that. So uh, yeah, I couldn't compare with that. So GED, it's uh, graph edit distance. It's a measure of how well the generated geometries preserve the original chemical bond graph. Um, here again, um, 
CG two AA. It's another. It was like also pretty fast, but it just ignored like one hundred atoms. Uh, so we couldn't really uh compute GED. So uh, so this generative back mapping method, my method, uh, in conclusion, it's fast and it's uh decent in terms of uh chemical validity and uh graph reconstruction. Um, yeah, compared to rule based methods. But as I mentioned before, I think it still can be better. Um, so this is the Atlas is a new data set released very, very recently, last month. And uh, it's a repository of uh, more than one, uh, more than 1500, I mean, uh, yeah, all autumn protein MD trajectories. Um, they were all constructed and uh, using the same method, uh, same force field, same water model, same temperature. So we are expecting more consistency within uh, this data set. And um, yeah, interesting thing is that this database entries involve proteins with uh, local and domain level confirmation of diversity, which means, um, so they include dual personality fragments, uh, which is, you know, uh, we have same sequence, but then their secondary structures are different because their uh, environments are different. I think this will give more local geometry diversity um, for our model. So yeah, the next step is uh, tra to train, to retrain the model with this data set and see what happens. This is another interesting observation uh, we had. Um, so uh, Bowen from MIT, uh, he was uh, running some uh, large scale Martini MD. And then um, Martini beads are different from C-alpha mapping. So Martini backbone bead is uh, actually a center of mass of all backbone atoms in a residue. Um, but when he used uh, Zenzi prop my method on the Martini uh, generated structures. The generated all autumn structures were pretty decent, and then like it, um, uh, it had all the like it retained all the secondary structures. It retained all the uh like it didn't have a lot of stereo clashes. Um, and then we found we thought like this was super interesting. Because C alpha and uh, central mass are uh, not the same, um, but we are sure that there there's a correlation, um, and then we are uh, looking to uh, train the model for Martini backmapping. And uh, one observation why this was possible is that um, central masses of the backbone have similar residue-residue neighbor distance compared to uh, C alpha, C alpha distances. So C alpha, C alpha distances are pretty well preserved uh, in like any kind of structures. It's usually uh, from somewhere from 3.6 angstrom to like 3.8 angstrom. But uh, yeah, and then the central mass of uh, backbone also had similar range of distances. So that was my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and yeah, I think that's like uh, the way it has been plus. I this one. I think it's the purpose is different between the sample composition versus the the generated back. Oh, okay. Uh, so what uh he asked is what's the difference between sampled and back map uh confirmations? So yeah, there are. Angles. 
yeah, angles. So they are the same. So uh, I call back mapped uh, angles as uh, sampled angles because you know we it's sample basically sampling from VAE. Right. That's our back mapping process. Yep. And then we are here, we are comparing it to ground truth distribution. Okay, just as fine. Yes, but then there are a few uh, plots where you have three different points, like that the ground truth and then uh, three that are open. Oh, oh, here. Oh, I see, I see. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, so here, uh, yeah, so what he asked is the difference between reconstructed and uh, sampled structures. And uh, if we go back to this VAE formulation. Um, so what I call, what I named reconstruction is uh, reconstruction from the encoder to decoder. So the input was the all of them structure. And then, uh, yeah, the decoder output was the reconstructive structure. So sample structure, I uh, what I mean is this inference scheme where we input the coarse grain structure and then uh, decode the, the all atom structure. So in this figures, uh, because, yeah, because for reconstruction structure, uh, we, like the encoder knew what the original structure was about. So it shows uh, more similar distribution compared to ground truths. So. Um, so PDB can, uh, the reason why I didn't use PDB was if we just use X-ray crystallography generated structure, then uh, those structures come from uh, energy minima, like just from the minima. But we want to, um, like our, we want our model to learn the distribution of uh, structures near the minima, uh, locally and also globally. So uh, I think if we want to make use of PDB structures, then we can like run short MD with uh, X-ray entries and then like include those uh, structures in the training set. And then we're ensembles. So the tricky thing is um, NMR ensembles are often uh, reconstructed with uh, back mapping methods. So it's sometimes it's uh, NMR methods uh, like generate uh, coarse grain uh, structure first, and then uh, we observe coarse grain structure first, and then like we use uh, some like previous uh, back mapping methods like modeler to reconstruct the all atom. So I thought uh, maybe that will give uh, the model the bias to like do something similar to uh, current method, which we don't know uh, if that's accurate enough. Um, great talk, guys. Like, very cool. Um, have you kind of thought about implementing maybe any of these ideas that we just heard, you know, like a self distillation data set that we see in like Alan Bolt 2 and like all these others? Like, have you tried doing one of those or not have gotten very well? Uh, sorry, can you, uh, what self distill distillation? So, so basically, like, Alan Bolt kind of like there's plenty of PDB structures, but Alan Bolt just wanted more, so they kind of or, or computationally like made new structures and then their first pass through like the, the their um through their transformer um, network they kind of predict labels so it is it's a way of getting a lot more training data mm -hmm. you obviously are losing quality training data so it's definitely something you might not even want to look into because the quality might not be there um yeah self distillation is definitely something a lot of like transformer models have kind of been implementing to kind of come over mm -hmm. limited training yeah so, so i was curious is that something like uh generating structures and then using it 
like and then including them back to the training set and then yes essentially generating new new samples and then using mm -hmm. the a, a naive prediction from your own model yeah. to assign labels and then use those generated and predicted training data mm -hmm. to kind of further further train it works really well with alpha pole too um mm -hmm. a new paper tr versus rna mm -hmm. uh, transformer model to predict rna structure it also worked very well for them so I just, it might be something you want to look into but mm -hmm. is this something like recycling and alpha pole yes uh, yeah. okay, okay. i think uh the uh the point of this uh, work is uh, like the one of the main points was speed. Uh, we want the algorithm to be fast enough. Mm -hmm. So because we want to use it in, uh, you know, when we do MD simulation, we, we get like tons of frames and then we want to like back mapping uh, them as soon as, as fast as possible. So in the inference stage, I don't think uh, like, yeah, unless we are looking for like better accuracy, yeah, I don't think uh, we can do recycling, but uh, we can, what we can do is, yeah, we can, uh, gener I think uh, generating structures from our model and then maybe we can, you know, like reweight them, uh, compute energy and then reweight them and then like uh, including them in the training data set. Uh, I think, yeah, that's possible and that could be helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have quite, I have actually a few questions, but I'll just ask one. And there's a question. Uh, on this. Oh. Oh, my short question would be um, actually two parter. First is, uh, what do you? It seems like um, this kind of thing might be a good playground for all the new diffusion models mm. uh, that are coming out. I assume that the diffusion model would be a little bit maybe too slow for what you want to do, but can you just say something about how using a VME versus using denoising diffusion, the pros and cons for this problem? Yes, yes. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, there was actually it was um uh, was it archive preprint or uh conference submission? So there was a submission uh at a conference. Um yeah, using diffusion model for uh, back mapping task. So uh, obvious cons is it's slow. Obvious pros is it performs better. So I think, yeah, there's a trade-off. Um, uh, so I guess we need to really like talk to uh, people who actually perform uh, core screen MD to figure out, you know, uh, how much speed they need and how much accuracy they need. And then maybe then we can like tailor the methods. Maybe if uh if we want to go a little bit further, maybe we can do auto regressive models, VAEs. If we want to uh go a lot further, then we can use diffusion models. Yeah. The question maybe it's probably better to read the question. Okay. Actually, you know what? I'll just tell you. You don't have to okay. Um I just yeah, right. All right. So so um Ketner Griswold has a question, uh, which is here you're using core screen MD simulations to generate your ensemble of backbone. I was wondering over what time scale MD divergence versus full out of models. I was also separately wondering how these core screen models preserve physical information for each resident, if at all. To that extent, how well do core screen models identify? Accurate large conformational changes in protein species. So that's another good question. Uh, but it's a little bit out of scope uh with my work. Uh so hmm, can I say? Uh what I can say is coarse grain, at least coarse grain machine learning potentials are not yet perfect. Uh it experiences missing modes missing metastable states problems sometimes. Uh, sometimes in a uh, rare uh, transition states, it uh, predicts something very absurd. Um, but it really depends on the system. I think, um, so right now, the recent coarse grain potential model, it was trained on 50 different proteins. 
Um, what I assume is if the test system is very different from the training distribution, uh, it will like perform worse. If it's in distribution, then it will perform better. That's why I think uh, this active learning scheme could be really helpful if we want to, uh, you know, test on like something that's a little bit different from the training set. And for that active learning, I think uh, the spec mapping can be really used. It's okay, no worries. <laughs> um, but if you want to do it, um, for me, for longer time, yeah. Oh. Mm. So, the question is, uh, the question is, is course grade MD more useful for large systems or uh, systems with long time scale of like conformational changes? I think it's, mm, that's a good question. I think it's both. So um, it's I, so it'll be useful obviously for uh, systems with uh, long uh, time scales of conformational changes, but uh, large proteins tend to have uh, that kind of long time scale because uh, there's, because like proteins are in water solution um, and, you know, there's a friction between uh, protein and water, and also it takes time for the protein to, uh, like if, you know, if we have a uh, protein with like this kind of open form, then uh, from the open form to closed form, this domain needs to like migrate to uh, this part. And then like that migration, uh, that diffusion takes time and it takes more time if it's larger. So yeah, I said both. Um, so I think these kind of plots are really important. And I'm wondering if another variable to consider looking at is like how varied a position is. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine like a position on the surface, it should have tons of freedom. Yes. All sorts of like sample applications where in the center usually mm -hmm. locks into like the one Yes. Um, I think like, yeah, other methods that are similar might not be able to capture that as well, but mm -hmm. because you need a lot of actual care that's the best about it. Like maybe yeah. you can actually determine something about the environment that constrains mm -hmm. like what controls are. Yes, yes. That's a really good question. So we reported a metric for diversity, which uh, is uh yeah, variance of RMSD compared to the original structure. So if the variance is large, it means that you know, the uh, generative st all auto structure is like flapping, uh, it's very flexible. If it's small, then it's, uh, you know, just stuck in one position. Uh, but actually that's a very good suggestion. We didn't compare, we didn't like analyze, uh, we didn't compare between like flexible positions and uh, globular compact positions. But I think, yeah, that's that can be really informative especially if we can uh, find the correlation between that flexibility and uh, entropy lost uh, from coarse graining, that could be helpful. Yes. I have one quick question then, um, Katner and mm. uh, so my quick question is, uh, what are your thoughts about, um, going back to the PCP, uh, so if you take, there are some, some data sets in the PDP where you, you have the same proteins and it's uh, crystallized at the cryogenic temperatures and fraction data was just uh, collected at cryogenic temperatures, mm -hmm. but the same protein crystals at room temperature. 
And in, in those data sets, we can draw from CD get the room, the room temperature crystals more oh. accessible to density and states of the protein. Maybe not as maybe some not gigantic uh, differences, but they're oh. good, clearly visible in density. And sorry, I, so my question is would that be an interesting uh, comparison to make with your model, the validation oh. of your model to say, oh, we did a sample, we, we, we were sampling, you just take the C alpha atoms of my protein. And I'm sampling in the distribution where room temperature crystal structure is sampling. Is that we thought about that? Oh, it makes sense. Yes, yes, it makes a lot of sense. I think a uh, backmapper model trained on data coming from like room temperature will uh, generate the dis local distribution in uh, corresponding to the room temperature. So uh, what you mentioned, I think it's definitely possible. Uh, one other thought about temperature is uh, I am like, this is this idea, uh, which I didn't test. Um, uh, so like, obviously the local distribution differs by temperature. If it's in a lower temperature, then it'll be more rigid. If it's in higher temperature, then it'll like move around a lot. Um, so maybe if we still use the VAE formulation, um, if we can like add a like temperature term, maybe in a variance term, uh, so that uh, in like if we condition uh, the generation on like low temperature, it'll like show lower variance. If we condition it on higher temperature, it'll show like larger variance. I think that could be cool. Uh, but I think to do that, we need a uh, good enough data set from like coming from several different uh, temperatures. So yeah. That's a good segue, I think, into Ketner's question. Uh, which is a shorter one this time. Um, you stated PEDS data set has a size of 84 proteins. How many conformational states are in each mm. of those ensembles? That's a good question. So uh, I used in total of uh, 10K conformations. So uh, that divided by 80. I'm, yeah, I can't compute it right now, but yeah. That'll be <laughs> average, but uh, it really differs a lot by entry. So some entries have uh, like 5K confirmations. Some entries only have like 20, 50. Okay. All right, well, we'll be around. I think we have any more you have offline. All right, thanks again, Sujan. We'll Thank you so that. much. <laughs> That wraps up our seminars for the year. Chris, you want to say anything? Say thank you, everybody. Thanks to all of our sponsors. Uh, we're going to kick things off again in 2024. Very soon, we'll be back on the other side of the Charles. And um, we have some other exciting stuff in the works.